ان الحمد لله نحمد ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئاتنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم ما بعد اوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله فقد امرنا الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ثم ما بعد In the language of religion we come across many times itemized lists that help us understand a particular concept So you might find that we have the five pillars of Islam. Bunyan as bunya al-Islam wa ala khams, the five pillars of Islam. Likewise, you hear that we have the six pillars of iman. We have the six pillars of iman. Similarly, they will say that you know there are the three pillars of aqida, right? They'll say the four principles related to aqida. So this helps an individual understand and and removes the guessing game from our brain so that we are not deducting or deducing from the sacred texts understandings that we may be wrong or also we don't have to remember every single time the hadith or the ayah related to that particular thing as long as we remember that there are five of this or six of this and seven of this or 10 of these now so today we're going to cover something very similar There is a book called Mujiz al-Mubin. It's a it's a very concise book written by a Yemeni scholar in the 950 Hijri and the focus of the book is that it wants to instill amongst the teenagers of that time the five the three basic things that they need to learn about their deen which is aqidah, fiqh and tazkiyah. Then in one of the chapters he talks about something very beautiful that I would like to share today with everyone. Today. where he says that nizam ud-din thalathatu ashya our deen so you have islam you have iman and when you join the two and when somebody puts all of that into practice and holds those beliefs then those actions your embodiment of these two things combined you would say you bahut deeni insaan hai this person has a lot of you know deeni what does that mean he is practicing we say in english he's a very practicing person Nizam ud-din thalathatu ashya that your religion is established your deen is established on three things these three things are not found in a hadith but rather it is on the theory of deduction by the ulama studying all the different ahadith and coming to realization that if somebody is going to claim that he has deen or if somebody is going to claim that mai deen wala hu i have deen in my life then he must have these three pillars to ensure that he remains on that was path Number one, an niyatu fi kulli ahwaliha, that you must be conscious and cognizant of your intentions every single moment of your life. That is why most of the ulama, if you entered Dr. Idris's room, all the hadith books, if you were to pick up any of those hadith books and open the first chapter of the first hadith, it's always what? Inna ma la'amalu bi. Our deen is intentions. Yesterday I was talking to somebody you know and, and a young girl she was like you know we were having these conversations about like feminine and masculine clothes and women not looking like men men not looking like women so she said what if i buy a men's shirt but my intention is that you know usually female shirts are tighter shirts button up shirts are tighter but if i get a small men's size then it's going to be a little bit looser so my figure is not going to be more exposed and that is a prime example of inna ma la'malu bin niyyah Yes, outwardly you can men should not be wearing, you know, women's clothes, women should not be buying men's clothes, but if a woman chooses to do that or if a man chooses, you know, something, outwardly that action may look like, oh, that's not right. But we are not to judge that person's intention. Right? So in the mal'amal bin niyat, so he says nidam ud-din thalathatu ashya and niyatu fi kulli ahwalina that you should have intentions and being cognizant of your intentions in every single moment of your life. Number 2 is fikr tafakkur thinking contemplating 
Unfortunately, our content connectivity states makes it very difficult for you and me to even have moments of constant, uh, moments of contemplation. We're constantly connected. We're constantly distracted. That is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he says so many times in the Quran, you'll be surprised if you look, if you have an Android phone, pick up that app, Quran Droid, and put in the word fikr. See how many verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. Do they not think? Do they not use their... Do they not ponder upon the verses, the signs, the you know, in the creations of the heavens and the earth are signs for those for the people who think, for the people who have intellect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly pointing towards our intellect. And fikr, the you know, in that book says is of two types. Al fikr fi khalqillah. Fikr in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you are going out for hikes, walks, you look at and you you you're amazed at what Allah has created and how things are morphing and evolving. All, all of this is fikr of first type. The secondary type of fikr is fikr in your own nafs. Look at how perfect your body is. Look at how perfect your heart is. Look at, look at how many things are taking place within your own body you don't have any control over. And even if you were to try to use your conscious mind to control it, you can't. A simple mere act of blinking. You can try it. You can try it, you can try to hold it, eventually your body is going to overtake your conscious mind. It's going to be like, screw that. Like, we're going to just, you know, right? You have no control over it. So, fikr, number two, the second pillar of our deen is fikr. A, a person who is deen dar, a person who claims to be deen wala, or somebody who has deen in their lives, they're a, pe- a person of, of, of deep thought. They think, they ponder, they think in the situation of the ummah, the condition of what's happening around the world. They not only react to what is happening to the Muslim state today. They not only react to what is happening place in to our brothers and sisters, whether is it, it is in Gaza or Kashmir or Myanmar or, or any of these places. They don't react to that. They're one step ahead of the game because they think. They're thinking, they're pondering, they're contemplating. They're, they are preempting what might possibly happen so that the solution can be. Uh, you know, those crises can be averted through their thinking. Our problem is we're not a nation of thinking anymore. We don't think, sadly. Like, I, I meet many times many, many other intellectuals from other faiths, and they're thinkers. They take time off. They may not be on the right religion, but they do have this capacity to think, to make decisions. That is our deen. That is why Prophet ﷺ, he said, Al-Mu'minu qiyi sun fatim. A believer is a sharp, like a razor sharp and highly intellectual person. Okay, he cuts through things. He sees through what's happening. But that only happens if we are thinkers. Lastly, he says, And not to take from this world except that which you need to survive. The minute we start ladening ourselves with abundance of this world, then we start hunkering ourselves down, bogging ourselves down, and our ability, our spiritual ability to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets hampered. So dunya, and you take from that, from this dunya, ex- only that which you require necessarily for your survival. I'm not saying that you start selling your cars today, but you know, if you have that car, that car should not be in your heart. It should be a means to your end not be the end. Nowadays we have a car like, you know, I have a neighbor mashallah, like he, his love for the car, he probably spends more time with the cars than the kids. Right? Like he's there polishing the rims, you know, putting some black thing on and I was like, subhanAllah, and then he's just going to take it off. And you have no control over it. like if rain comes, all of that effort is gone. Right? That is that you do not take from this world except that which you need. Right? Your car should be clean. That's it, right? Now having a, you know, you know, all this other, and, and again, and, and one more thing about, you know, very clear that, you know, I want to be very clear about that, that, you know, when it comes to the matter of Israq or when it comes to the matter of you taking from this world excessively, the difference is, the ulama they have said, is based on the person's capacity. So if somebody's making a $50,000, 50000 60000 $70,000 income and he goes and takes out a brand new M5 on lease, that for that individual is in his off. Because he has gone and stretched beyond his means 
and put other priorities in his life at risk for a pleasure of dunya. But if a person is making, on the contrary, if a person happens to be making 15, 20, 25 thousand dollars a month, and that person goes and takes out an M5, and he knows that he's going to get a tax credit or whatever for that, then that is not israf in this person's health. What is not allowed for in both cases is whether you are a rich person that is driving an expensive car or a poor person, your heart is not connected to them. You have so many people who are poor who may not have, like they're just meeting their ends, but their hearts are connected to the old car they have. That destroys our deen. That is why Prophet ﷺ, he said, that remind yourself of death, that everything you own, you're going to leave everything behind and you're going to walk away. Right? So remind yourselves of constant death. Right? And That the love of this world is the head of every single source of problem that you're, you know, a mistake that you're going to make on behalf of this. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He helps us establish deen in our hearts, inshaAllah. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده. إن أين بيأس الله سبحانه وتعالى إن بدرس infinite names and his boundless bount and his boundless mercy that الله سبحانه وتعالى encompasses every single one of us with his maghfirah and mubarak. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he elevates every single one of us in our statuses in this dunya and akhirah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you know, he grants every single one of us, our families, the taste, the sweetness of iman until the day of judgment. They remain on the path of iman and the path of haq until we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask that the deen that we want to establish in our lives is established with the way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his messengers of the past had intended to be established in our lives. And we become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with every day that passes, every day and every moment that we live in this life. So the day that we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes the best day of our lives.